just had uh, you know a brief encounter with with Charles today with just having lunch and talking about a few things but um, from his bio you can see he has a very extensive credit history of things that he's done and he's going to speak about that today and uh, just I'm, uh, we actually were uh, connected to Charles through Jay so we have to thank Jay Franzi for hooking us up with this opportunity because otherwise without Jay's participation we would not have had that that encounter so um, I will let Charles speak more for, about his experiences and stuff like that, but I'd like to introduce him at this point. Charles Dodd, thank you. Hi. I'm not going to use the mic very much. <clears throat> Probably going to walk around. Anyway, um, my name's Charles Dye. And um, I'm a recording engineer, mixing engineer, uh, who's been doing this for about almost 20 years. And um, just gonna, I want to tell you, I want to talk about three basic things today. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my uh, path uh, of how I uh, started out and got to where I am. And uh, it's a fairly traditional path. Um, uh, you know that uh, I'll sort of walk you through the the ladder of, uh, of, of, of how you make your way through engineering uh, and, and, and and climb up it and so forth. Uh, then I want to talk about uh, briefly uh, or just uh, for a portion uh, of my conversation with you, I want to talk about the music industry and where it is today. And then I want to talk at the end a little bit about uh, where we might be after uh, we get through where we are right now with the music industry. Um, and I just noticed my belt came undone. I'm going to explain that to all of you unnecessarily. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Great start. <laughs> we got we to move this lamp down because I'm going to be lifting my glass over the wire every time. Okay. So I went to school like many of you probably have or did, uh, and studied engineering. I got an internship from my school. Uh, my school was in Ohio. My internship was in Miami at Criteria Studios, now called Hit Factory. And um, I kicked butt on my internship, knowing that I had an opportunity to hopefully impress them that I, I would be a good person to hire. Um, um, I stayed in touch with them after I completed my internship. Uh, I apparently succeeded in impressing them because three months later an opening came up and they hired me. Um, so now I'm low man on the total pole at a five, six room facility. Uh, fortunately for me, world class, but that was my goal when I, when I asked the internship coordinator what my studio choices were. Um, she said, there's a studio in Cleveland, you could go there. And, or we've got a studio in some other places that I didn't know, and then she mentioned Miami, and I had relatives there, so I took the one in Miami. Actually, somebody else went to the studio in Cleveland and ended up being Trent Reznor's engineer for about 20 years, so I missed out on that opportunity. Oops. <laughs> He's very successful. His name is Sean Belling. Um, nonetheless, uh, um, I went to Miami. So I'm in this six-room facility. Like I said, it's world class, so I'm... I'm I've got the opportunity to work with a lot of really talented engineers and really talented producers and watch how they work and, of course, talented musicians and, and, and talented and successful artists. So I, I'm, I'm, you know, working my way through moving from tape copies to getting my first shot at uh, assisting on a sessions. And uh, that opportunity came up. And I just continue to work my way through assi uh, assisting until uh, you know, I'm working on the better sessions and, uh, and then eventually getting to do some engineering here or there. Following my being an assistant engineer at Criteria, I went to Crescent Moon Studios, which is a studio owned by Gloria and Emilio Estefan um, in Miami. And uh, I had, at the time of working at Criteria, I had asked most of the other assistants and engineers, most of the assistants, who's the best engineer in town? And they uniformly told me, all of them, Eric Schilling. Eric Schilling, a phenomenally talented engineer, uh, and I felt like 
working together with him would be something I want to do so that I can learn from him, since everybody said he's the best engineer in town. So he was Gloria and Emilio's engineer, and they had recently built a studio, uh, and I had heard that uh, they had two rooms and that they might be in need of a new assistant. Uh, but I felt that since they had two rooms and they had one Eric, that there was the opportunity for engineering in that second room. And uh, if I played my card right, I could, I could get some engineering work and, and start working on those records as an engineer. So I, I got the job as the assistant. And I'd already been doing some freelance engineering at that part, at that point. But I, I realized that I, if I take a step back in my career and become an assistant all over again, that there's an opportunity to work on some good records here. So I, I took the opportunity and uh, I uh, worked there and was an assistant for a while and was quickly given the engineering chair by Eric just to fill in here or there and then eventually more and more trust was built up and of course I'm assisting Eric as he's mixing so I'm learning a lot from that. And, and I had, I've worked with a lot of great artists. I worked with a lot of great artists there at their studio and at the, at the criteria before that. Um, but I really learned a lot from working with talented producers and uh, uh, engineers. I've, I've had the opportunity to work with Tom Dowd uh, and uh, Phil Ramone and, and, and wor working with these people and sitting in the control room and, and just watching them and, 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 and observing how they interact and the things that they do is just, it, it's always so enlightening. And so I, I had this opportunity to basically be Eric's assistant as he was mixing records for a number of years. And th that opportunity, even though I was engineering, I was often assisting him on mixing, that opportunity is really where I learned to, to train my ears as a mixer. Now, I didn't exactly learn the nuts and bolts of what he was doing mixing-wise by just watching him. But Fortunately, as the assistant, I had to document all the mixes. So when he went home at 1 o'clock or whenever it was, I spent a fair amount of time soloing tracks up and popping things in and out as I'm writing down all the settings to, to, to kind of try to grasp it. Like many recording engineers, my real goal was to want to try to become a mixing engineer someday and a, uh, a, a producer. So um, I continued to follow and pursue learning to mix, uh, all of it self-taught. And uh, um, I wasn't really quite hitting it. I, wasn't, I didn't think my mixes were sounding like records. And, and they weren't, but I mean, I didn't think they were. I knew they weren't. Uh, the next opportunity that came up was Desmond Child opened a studio in town. And I had been an, an engineer uh, at, at Crescent Moon, but when Desmond Child, produ producer for Oh, at the time he had worked, not as a producer, as a songwriter, he had worked with uh, Bon Jovi and Aerosmith um, and Kiss. Uh, those were some of his big credits at the time. Also Michael Bolton and a number of other people. And for some of these projects he had produced, but he hadn't produced for Bon Jovi or Aerosmith. But nonetheless, <coughs> Desmond was moving to Miami and an opportunity opened up actually from early college networking, a guy who I had uh, taught engineering to and who... Who, who sort of took over a, a job that I had at the University of running the live sound system. He had been Desmond's engineer in Los Angeles, and when Desmond moved to Miami, my friend called me up and uh, asked me um, if I'd like to meet Desmond and talk to him about working for him in Miami. So I went and met Desmond, and the first question he asked me was, what's your sign? <laughs> Fortunately, the sign I have was apparently what he wanted to hear. I'm a Leo. <laughs> Apparently, I got the job. So, so I'm, I'm now working for Desmond, and he's hired me to be his chief engineer and studio manager. Um, so it's a step up. Uh, and uh, uh, we're working on a number of cool records, uh, some of them up-and-coming artists, and uh, some of them more established. Um, but the thing that had happened for me originally was when I got started in all of this, I was working on analog tape, 24 track. <coughs> And digital machines, 32 track and 24 and 48, were, were coming in, but, but really what everybody was using at that time were analog tape machines. When I went to Crescent Moon, so it, in other words, Criteria was, was primarily analog. They had one or two digital. Actually, they had one. Uh, um, but when I went over to Crescent Moon, they had both Sonic Solutions, or originally they just had a Synclavier and a Post Pro. And then 
Eric was looking to get a sonic solution system. So together with Eric and another engineer, the three of us partnered, and we, we got a, a, the sonic solutions system. And so that, my experience with the Post Pro and with the sonic solutions were my introduction to uh, DAWs. When I went over to Desmond's studio, um, Desmond had Pro Tools. Now, to this day, I don't actually know what possessed Desmond to base his studio off of Pro Tools. And I, by possess, I mean it was really a cutting edge thing for him to do. He based his studio off of Pro Tools. I don't know where he got the idea. I never asked him. What year was that then? That's 95. I mean, that's like so <laughs> ahead of the curve. So ahead of the curve. We had a 24 track Atari in the closet, but its purpose was to transfer from and to. And we never transferred to. So its real purpose was to transfer from. We did not have a massive Pro Tools system. We didn't actually have, and it wasn't designed, to do anything more than vocal comp. That was Desmond's vision. His vision was he could do the most amazing vocal comps in the world on Pro Tools. He had, he had seen somebody using it. And Desmond, Desmond is and was at the time, but he is today still, the most amazing vocal producer I've ever worked with in my entire life. The man visualized the finished vocal as he's writing the lyrics months before. I mean, he hears the finished vocal, and then he produces it out of the singer's mouth. And if you ask any singer that he's worked with, Steven Tyler or, or John Bon Jovi or whoever, uh, I've watched Desmond coach a vocal from Steven where, where Steven's at the mic, and Desmond is standing right there, and he's almost conducting him like an orchestra. But that's not the point, and he doesn't always do that. But my, my point is, I've also watched him produce in the more traditional way that you would expect, which is dis explaining to the vocalist what they'd like to, to do, or trying to draw the vocalist to the emotions that they need, et cetera, et cetera. Amazing producer, uh, and an amazing vocal producer. So he must have seen somebody using Pro Tools and realized, since what Desmond was doing prior to that was he was into comping vocals, totally into comping. What you did prior to a DAW and piece pacing it together was you would uh, switch back and forth on a console and potentially print it to a third track between two tracks. The guys that were really into vocal comping had a little box with a fader, very similar to a DJ mixer. And, and multiple inputs on the box. And they would come off the tape machine with three or four or five tracks. And between the two, between the, I think it had five buttons, I don't recall, he showed it to me once. You could choose the A button and the B button. And so now you've got the, the first line and then you could do a crossfade to the next track and then, and now you're printing this comped vocal. Can't move anything in time, of course, but you are, you are creating a vocal performance that couldn't have been created any other way. And you're creating a vocal performance that couldn't have been created with punching or with, with switches. You're creating it with the, with the crossfades that, that allowed you more flexibility. So Desmond saw all of that possibility and more in, a, in Pro Tools. So that was his vision. But when I showed up, I said, I think we could do a lot more. I mean, just like everybody in this room that's, that, that's pursuing engineering, uh, we're problem solvers for the most part. We see patterns and we see trends. And we, we see a pattern forming in front of us, and we figure it out quickly, and we solve problems and so forth. So I've, been, I've seen these types of patterns and, and shifts and trends. And one of the first times I, I saw something that was quite clear to me as far as a trend was the, 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 the project studio move. I'm working in a million dollar room, and we're using, you know, $3,000 worth of equipment every day. We're using a mic pre, a microphone, and one track on a tape machine with one musician. And I went, but this is a million dollar room, and we're not using a million dollars worth of equipment. So as soon as the Mackie console and the digital uh, multi modular multitrack showed up, ADATs and Tascams, I realized that this was going to really change things, so I invested in uh, a bunch of uh, the Tascams, the DA, 38s, I think they were called back then. And a were they 88s? 38. Oh, 38 came later. Yep, right. So um, I got three of those together with uh, two partners and uh, a Mackie console, and we were able to do record quality work in a project studio. I mean, it's still working at, at Crescent Moon Studios at the time, but we were able to do stuff that we would then take into Crescent Moon and, uh, and turn into records. So we were essentially doing the song demos, but song demos that sounded like records. 
So I'd already been doing Project Studio work uh, for two years or so when I got to Desmond's. Desmond's studio was also a project studio. It was converted to car garage. Um, and he had the Pro Tool system where he was just intentionally or intending to just do the vocal comps. And basically his vision was people would, artists would come in with the multi-track, we transfer over what vocals they had and maybe a mix of the music into Pro Tools, he would then produce an amazing vocal and we would print it back on the analog tape and then they would go out with that and you know, go back to the studios and finish the rest of the record. But I'd been doing the, the, the project studio thing now with 24 tracks of, of digital tape for two plus years and I said, we are close to being able to do that here. We didn't have the track capability at the time, but I pushed, sorry about that, I pushed Desmond uh, to upgrade the Pro Tools so that we would have a 48 track capability. And we did at, within, within 12 months of me coming there, I think sooner than that. So we did a record in late 95, 96, that was all Pro Tools recorded. We recorded the basic drums, uh, drum tracks at Criteria because we didn't have a, a drum room, but every other track was recorded inside of Pro Tools. And then it went to mix uh, also. Now, I was a recording engineer on this and you know, always shooting for the mixer slot. Still, still trying to get there someday. Um, but, uh, but I wasn't getting the mixing gigs. Desmond was going up to New York usually to have somebody else mix, or Nashville. Usual suspects. Uh, Dave, what's the guy's name? With three distressors. Dave Durr. Dave Durr. No, no, he's the guy that makes the distressors. The guy that uses the three distressors in the band splitter. <laughs> In, in New York, and he just mixed some of the half a Coldplay's record. Anyway, great, great mixer. Uh, and so he mixed uh, this record that we recorded all in Pro Tools. And, uh, and then he was off, Desmond was off and going to Nashville and having Chuck, Amy, of course, uh, mix some stuff. So um, I've got him working on these records as a recording engineer, and, and uh, I'm trying on my demo mixes to learn to, 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 you know, to make my mixes compete. But they're not, at least not enough for Devin to use me. Uh, but what I am realizing, though, is the capability of what this system can do. Because when we started that record, the artist's name was Billy Myers. She was an English artist. She was on uh, Epic Records. The name is Billy. She's a girl. Uh, the, the, the biggest hit off the record was Kiss the Rain. Not massive, but you may have heard of it. So this is like 96 when the record came out. So. When we started that record, it was my goal to attempt to record the entire record on Pro Tools. Didn't know if we could, but I thought we could try to pull off not using tape. Just thought we could. I thought it was possible. We did, but I didn't know it was going to be possible until we got to the end. And once we did, that kind of opened the doors up to me seeing the capabilities <coughs> and the possibilities. So I started to realize we had a lot of, we could do a lot more in here than, than what I may have initially thought. I, I did not initially start mixing inside of it. In other words, I was still mixing on an analog console. And, and, and I treated it primarily as a tape machine. So when the next project came in, uh, I started to do some of the demo mixes on that project uh, all inside the box, just demo mixes. So you know, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to break new ground. I was just trying to see what it was going to sound like. And the mixes were coming out OK. It, it was a little bit of a, a hurdle, and there were some problems. It sounded really clean and sterile and boring. Didn't have any character or personality. It sounded like it sounded hyper digital, like, like ticky ticky, I call it. You know, it's like, no chuka chuka, it's all ticky ticky. So, uh, <laughs> lots of high end. Yeah, yeah, lots of high end and no warmth or saturation. That was what I was lacking. Because I started out on analog. I, I only listened to records recorded on analog as a kid. So, my ears are wanting to hear analog sounds. So, um, but I'm trying to mix on the system. And I'm starting to use more plugins. And this is not a plug-in talk, but, uh, or a Pro Tools talk. Uh, we just happen to be talking about it for the moment. Um, but I, I'm realizing that my limitation is that there's really a missing element here. And I'm talking to David Frangioni, who some of you might know. He had a company here in Boston called Audio One for many years. He was uh, uh, Aerosmith, and still is, I'm, I'm sure. 
uh, main guy for uh, a lot of, uh, um, uh, of their studios. He built a lot of their studios. And he now is in, in Miami. And David uh, was one of the people that helped build Desmond's studio. He was, uh, we got all of our Pro Tools upgrades through him. And um, David was sort of my go-to guy for asking questions about Pro Tools, kind of a, like a, 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 somebody who had more experience than me on Pro Tools at the time that I would go to and ask him questions. And he told me about some plugins that I didn't know about from a company in Spain called Dewey that emulated tape saturation and tube saturation. The tube saturation plugin is called Valve. That's what they call tubes in Europe. And the other one is called Tape. Um, and uh, Waves came out with some new compression and EQ plugins at the time, Renaissance EQ and Renaissance Compressor. These days, Renaissance Compressor is fairly well respected for not sucking. It's a pretty darn good compressor. <laughs> but back then, nobody was using it, but I was pretty impressed by what this plugin could do as a plugin. It's a pretty cool compressor. Very, very flexible. It's kind of the distressor before the distressor existed plugin. It, it emulated Opto and Electro. And it had a lot of cool stuff. Warm, clean, all that good stuff. Not quite like the uh, distressor, but anyway, that idea. And um, so I found that using Valve and Tape and Renaissance EQ and Renaissance Compressor, I could get kind of analog sounding mixes. Kind of. Not bad. I was, I was starting to feel pretty good about at least the sonics of the stuff. At the same time, though, it is eating DSP up. Okay, this is like 96, 97. So there's, I, I'm getting about a third to a half of the way through the mix, and now I have to commit my drum sounds, and I have to commit my bass sound, and I have to commit my guitar sounds, and then continue the mix. And to get to that point in your mix, and then take, I don't know, a half hour to 45 minutes, right as you're starting to groove and cook on the mix, to just do this really tedious process of printing, it just, it, it really destroyed the mixing process, made it very unfluid, and I saw that as a major barrier, the lack of DSP power. And we had this thing maxed out. The most number of cards you could put in. You know, we had a chassis, we had like 13 cards or something stupid. Because that you could get away with 13 to 11 cards back then. A as they kept making the cards more powerful, you could do less and less cards. So in 1998, I went to the AES show, and uh, Digidesign had just released a new uh, card at the time that they were calling Mix. And this card was twice as powerful. And you could still put just as many cards in the system. So I realized now that I would be able to do a whole mix without stopping. And, and the point I should make is that Valve and Tape, especially <coughs> Valve and Tape, very DP, uh, DSP intensive plugins. They're, 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 they, 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 that was one of the reasons why I was having to print tracks, because I was using them on a fair amount of the tracks to get that punchiness. So when I went to AES, I, I realized that the amount of DSP that was going to be available was going to really sort of turn, to change what I would be able to do, to the point where I thought, you know what, this is going to actually change things for a lot of people. That was my belief. So I came back to the Desmond studio and I said to Desmond, I said, Desmond, he wasn't using me as a mixer. So I said, I'll bet you that within one year, you're going to mix a record in this room. Now, I didn't mean that I was going to mix the record. I was referring to the technology. I just told him about this new hardware. I said, within one year, I'll bet that you'll mix a, mix a record in this room. He derisively laughed at me. I mean, it's like, <laughs> he's just like, Mocked me and walked away. <laughs> Nine months later, Living Living the Local was number one on the charts, and it had been mixed in that room. So it happened faster than I thought. But that was the project we were working on at that time. We were working on this working art record, and uh, I was the recording engineer on it. Still shooting for that mixer slot, not getting it. And uh, it came time to, to mix the record. Uh, they sent the tracks up to New York City to be mixed by a usual suspect guy, very talented mixer, and um, they weren't happy with his mix. They felt, they the producers, felt that I had captured something with the rough they liked. Um, it wasn't, my mix at the time wasn't a finished mix, but they, there was something I had captured that they liked. You've all heard this story before, it's a similar story, it happens all the time. So. That's why I said part of my path, or much of my path, this is a fairly traditional one. 
So they gave me a shot at mixing my version of it. So fortunately, I didn't have to start from scratch. I just opened up my session and took my rough mix and spent more time on it to do a lot of tweaky you know, rides, the kind of thing you do when you're really doing a finished mix, a lot, a lot more detail in, the, in the, the fills before the transitions and popping the drums out or, or whatever, various rides. I spent about three or four hours doing rides. And, and then that mix was sent out along with the other guys' mix to you know, the artists and the manager and, and the label people and the producers. And I'm not sure who decided what, but in the end, my mix was the one that was used for the record. And from there, I got to mix five other songs on the, on the album because of that was a, a, a very different sounding record, not from my point of view, but I mean, not from my job. But the, the record itself, the song, the production, I mean, the, so much about it was so different sounding that, 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 that everybody that was working on the record, and there were two to three different producers working on the album, and not just Desmond. Desmond was producing about half of it. And so I got to mix at least one of the songs from the other producers, uh, one of Emilio's uh, productions, and then four others of Desmond's. So that was sort of the beginning of, of my career as a mixer, but just before that, I had done a mix um, uh, for Sammy Hagar, where I was being given a shot, still trying to get the mixing gig, this is right before Rick and Uh I was still trying to get a mixing gig, and I was given a shot to do a mix for, for Sammy Hagar. He had just recorded a record in Pro Tools, and um, he was looking for somebody to mix in Pro Tools. And so um, I, uh, I, I did a mix for him where this, this mix, it was a cool song, you know, it always helps, right, when it's a good song. Uh, this mix was the very first time in my life that I heard something coming out of a pair of speakers that I thought that sounded like a record that, that you know, my hands had hit on. I never before experienced that. Now, I've been trying to figure out how to mix for years at this point, and had actually gotten to the point literally months before that where I had resigned myself to just being a recording engineer. You know, Some people can do it, some people can't. And I'd been attempting to do it for so long, it was very clear to me at that point in time that I can't, that I wasn't born with it. But like three months later, I mean, it, I was... I was blown away by the mix, and I had just completed it. So that told me that everything I had believed, that I wasn't, that my mixes weren't getting better, uh, that, uh, that you can't learn to mix. You know, there's this thing out there, people say, uh, you can't be taught to mix, you can only learn it. In other words, the implication is you can teach yourself, but no one can teach you. Um, I felt that that's probably not all true, that maybe you can learn to mix because I did, somehow. The problem that I had at the time was I thought, well, maybe I just stumbled into this. Maybe I'm never going to be able to do it again. Maybe this was an accident. So at that point, I really felt the pressure to figure out how the hell I did it so that I could do it again. Because <laughs> I really didn't know. But when I went through it, I, 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 kind of, I kind of not only went through that mix to see what the elements were that made it, in my opinion, head and shoulders above the rest, but also started comparing my other work. And I started to see there was a path, you know, where my mixes, I could he literally hear the improvements. And I started to understand wh what, what, I, what I had taught myself and what I had learned, some of it I had learned. It, it helped the fact that I was working with Desmond, and he's not the kind of person that can teach mixing. That's not what he, he's, he's not technical at all, but he's an extremely demanding person. And the great, I res, my personality type responds phenomenally well to that personality type because that makes me want to always do better. So, you know, he'd bring in a Shania Twain record and he'd say, make it sound like that. You know, it's like some of the best sounding stuff there was at the time. So I'm like, make the piano sound like that or make the vocal sound like that. And he was always challenging me. He didn't know what made the vocal sound like that, but I could listen to it and try to figure it out. So, or make the piano sound like that. So uh, I would do it, and when I'd get to the point where he'd be satisfied, I'd know, all right, I'm doing something right here. And I essentially would tuck that little technique into my tool belt and just keep it there, and then, you know, this kept happening. And it had been happening all along. 
And I got to the point where I sort of realized that um, mixing wasn't really a singular skill or a singular ability. It wasn't something you were born with. It was essentially, or and is essentially, a number of individual techniques that on each, and each of them by themselves doesn't make a great mix. But if you can do all of them together on the same song, you can create a great sounding mix. Uh, we're, this is not a class to talk about those things. But, but briefly, if you can make the kick sound good, and the snare sound good, and the hi-hat sound good, and the tom sound kick ass, and I'm still struggling with cymbals, and the cymbals sound good, and the bass sound great, and the guitars sound great, and uh, the keyboards, usually secondary and stuff I'm working on, but make them do their job of being the watercolor in the background, um, and uh, get all the percussion sounding cool, and the horns, and then get the backgrounds to sound amazing, and then get the vocal to sit on top of the whole thing. Okay, now it just sounds good, but it's not a mix. And then figure out automation and how to do that. And then lastly, vocal rides and the, the art of a vocal ride and what makes the vocal sound so expressive and emotional when it's, the vocal ride is done properly. Basically, if you can put all of that together on every one of your mixes, you can mix. So when I figured that, it kind of, it kind of, but when I, when, I, when I came to the realization that it really was just these techniques, it actually made me really mad because I've been scouring articles and interviews. You know, I love the interviews. And, and, and God bless Maureen Droney, because she can get answers out of people that nobody else can, and her follow-ups are brilliant, but she can still get them to only come up with two techniques that they're actually willing to share, <laughs> except for the Mick Gazowski article where there are about four or five. That was a great one. That was a great interview. Read the Mick Gazowski interview. Really good, <coughs> really good interview by Maureen Droney, Mix Masters. Burke the books. Uh, <laughs> um, so um, I felt like, wow. I really wish somebody would have taught me this. I wish somebody would have sat me down and said, you can learn this, and here are the techniques that you need to learn. So um, kind of to take a jump off for a moment of explaining my, my career as an as a engineer and a mixer, I kind of got the bug to want to help people learn what I learned. So i am now got my own studio with a production partner, and we're... Uh, you know, busy, and we've got a lot of work happening, and uh, got interns, and got one talented intern that comes in from a school who really seems to have promise. So I'm going to see if I can teach this kid a lot of the things I know. Basically, try to try to do a brain dump on him because he's really smart, and even try to teach him mixing. And it kind of, I, I mean, this is my very first time attempting to teach mixing, but I kind of succeeded at it. It was kind of a test. I mean, his rough mixes were pretty good, and he was only out of school a few months, and he didn't walk in with these abilities. So that kind of inspired me to try to find a way to put all this down on paper and communicate it to others. And right around that same time, DigiDesign asked me to write a column for them for something they had coming up in the future that at the time didn't exist, but came into existence at the same time as my column debuted that they called DigiZine. Today, it's a quarterly and it's on paper, but back then it was an e-zine and it was monthly. So uh, Digital Design asked me to, to, to write a column, uh, and it was my goal and hope with this column that I could teach mixing. And I didn't set out, well, I'll, I did send out, set out to do that. I didn't state it in the first column because at the time it was considered impossible to teach. So why invite a bunch of people saying, you know, you can't teach that. I, I won't. I'll just bring them in, build the trust, and it'll become clear into month six that we're learning to mix, and by month 12, maybe they'll have learned to mix. And, and it was really successful. I mean, it was a free column, but it was really successful. I get emails from people who've just, it's still on the Digi website, who've just discovered it last week, and, you know, they say, I I sat up for three days reading every one of those. Some of them really long, 3,000 words, you know, 4,000 words, really long articles. But, uh, you know, I sat up for three days reading all your articles or, you know, I, I've read your articles a million times. I, I read them right before every mix and stuff like that. Really complimentary, really appreciative of the fact that I put that down. So as far as the next step with education, I, 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 a guy who I had met uh, teaching master classes for digital design uh, at the DigiWorld events 
at one of these uh, uh, at DigiWorlds. Um, he uh, had a video company and was interested in interviewing me for a video, just like for like a four minute portion of a video that he was gonna be doing. And I told him I wasn't really interested in doing that, but I've got this material that I was considering to putting into a book form that talks about trying to teach mixing, or talks about teaching mixing, it, te it attempts to teach mixing, and I'd like to do it as a video. What, what do you think? And he said, yeah, cool, let's do that. So we did this DVD, this video, and it's called Mix It Like a Record, and it, it's, its goal is uh, to teach mixing. I've kind of evolved my, 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 my mixing teaching since then, and I, I've come up with some other ways to, to distill the techniques. At the time, my thinking was, as I told you, teach each one of the techniques. I've, I've now, and to use actual examples. What to me always seemed to be mix, missing in my reading about attempting to learn <coughs> mixing was we were always talking about a phantom kick drum, so I couldn't hear it, and we were talking about vague settings, vague compression settings, because it's a phantom kick drum. So since I can't hear the kick drum that the person is talking to me about, that they can hear, they have to assume a vague general kick drum, and then since they know that I can't hear the kick drum, they're not gonna be precise about the settings to use on the compressor or the EQ. And since you all know, you don't use the same setting on every kick drum, you use similar settings, but not the same. For every kick drum, every, every beast is different, and every snare, et cetera, is different, every vocal is different. So you can't, you can't actually teach the direct, here's the vocal, here's the kick, and here's what I'm gonna to do to it. But with, with DAWs and the ability to give people the audio, and with plugins, being able to give people the settings, that's when I realized I can actually impart a lot more information than was previously possible. So with the column, with DigiDesign, uh, we actually made all the sessions available for download at the time. And then on the DVD, we did the exact same thing. So on the DVD, the idea was we went through every track and we showed, here's what we did on this track, blah, blah, blah. Not to bore you with the details, but we went through every track. And, 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 I, and I realized there's a, a huge flaw in this, of course. It's super specific, that's its weakness, but it's, 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 uh, it's, it's also its strength. Because at least I can convey information about how to deal with this one situation. And since then I've come up with a number of, of ways to convey ideas and theories and approaches to mixing that are unspecific, but still manage to accomplish all the same goals so that they can be applied to whatever you're doing. But I guess really the point I'm trying to make is, is that, that um, I've gone from uh, uh, um, you know, somebody who didn't know how to do any of this to somebody that really enjoys teaching it. And uh, uh, I've gone from you know, assistant engineer to engineer to mixer and doing some production. And uh, all of that, that whole path, that whole ladder that I've kind of walked you through is uh, and has been uh, a great experience for me. But that brings us to sort of where we as an industry have been since, I mean, it was probably pretty obvious in 2006, but it obviously started much earlier around 2001 and two and three uh, when things started to slow down. Now, we've got a couple of forces at play here. We've got the whole desktop audio thing happening. So that's taking work from bigger studios into the home studio. But a lot of people in this room are harnessing that anyway. So that's not the thing that's really impacting us for the most part. Uh, what's impacting all of us uh, who have a passion for music um, and who uh, um, you know, love working with musicians and love working on that process that ends up with, you know, that amazing sounding record at the end, is the fact that the budgets at the labels have just shrunk so hugely. And as, as much as people say this is not true and that when people share music on the internet it leads to sales, it just doesn't, and that's a lie. Uh, it leads to a decline in sales. So uh, this is the depressing part of the talk. Um, hold out hope for the end, please. Um, for the last, uh, I don't know, 12 months, let's say, 
I've been attempting to talk in a way that I'm not hearing anybody else talk, in a very frank way. Um, sometimes when I, I, I talk to people about this who are really new and young, you know, students just getting in, they're, they're shocked to hear it, especially since they're part of the problem, <laughs> or their <laughs> friends are. Uh, um, but nonetheless, I just want to talk about uh, really where we are as an industry and uh, for a moment. Um, about 10 years ago, major label budgets were around two fifty dollars to $300,000 for one album, to, for the recording. Major label, major artist. These days, about 10 years later, major lab last year, major label budgets were averaging around $30,000. In the last seven or eight years, <coughs> sales have gone down 10 to 15, depending on who you talk to, depending on what numbers they're looking at. Now, you can't take 10 to 15% off the sales seven years in a row or eight years in a row and have very much left at the end of that. Um, uh, so last year, like I said, the major label budgets. Now, indie label budgets 10 years ago were 85,000, 50,000, 60,000, 40,000, okay? And the majors last year had numbers that were smaller than the indies eight, nine, 10 years ago. So, you know, that's not my phone, I don't think. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so that's the majors. The Indies, though, last year, the year before last, um, they were budgeting, you actually heard numbers like 30 three years ago, two years ago. A friend of mine was signed to Vagrant, and that's what they were telling them per record. Um, but uh, I know that the last year they were much closer to 10,000 per record. Um, we... This may be news to many of you. We are at a really <coughs> shocking point right now. Does anybody in this room know what's happening at the Indie Labels at this point for record budgets? Pay for play. Bring the record in and record it. We're not going to give you a penny. Then we'll release it. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll release it. We've got a contract that says we don't have to. Um, maybe we'll spend some money on marketing. Maybe not. We've got a contract that says we don't have to. But what we won't do is give you any money to record the record. You pay for that entirely on your own. It's dramatic. Um, so I said that, that I talked about the ladder idea, that there's a ladder that I climbed up, a traditional ladder. Uh, it's, the ladder has changed dramatically. I mean. It was my view a few years ago, having nothing to do with piracy, that the project's desktop audio revolution had changed engineering forever from, in, in, in my opinion, and I'm curious what your, by the way, I meant to say this at the beginning, you're, you're, you're welcome and encouraged to ask questions and interrupt at any time and join in on this conversation. Um, that it's my view, having nothing to do with piracy, as I said, that in fact engineering with the desktop audio uh, movement really changed music engineering, changed from being a, a career path to, for engineers and really became a skill set for musicians. That's my observation. Um, because you've got uh, triple scale guys in LA recording their own drums and guitars at their home studios sending the tracks to other people. So it's, that's, that's what it is. That's, that's what it has become. And that's not necessarily a budget thing as much as it, I mean, it is. It was driven by budgets uh, because basically somebody who previously had uh, $1,000 to spend on uh, um, a, a drum session because they could do the studio and everything, they now have 500. And, uh, there's not much money left in that for the drummer, but the ingredient you must have is the drummer. So the drummer knows that if he just doesn't pay the, the cartage fee or doesn't have their cli his client uh, pay the cartage fee, drum kit stays at home, He's, he, he makes an investment in mics, he makes an investment in some DAW, and, uh, and then records the drums and sends them back the tracks. 
the drummer knows that now the budget has enough room for him to get paid what he got paid five years ago. So that's the trend that's happened and is happening everywhere. That's not a surprise to any of us because that's, that's the technology that we're all using. So we know that. But what we may not know is, is, is how it actually seems to be filtering out into the industry. Um, so because of that and because of piracy, uh, which we'll talk about in a little more detail in a minute, it, it, it's, it's, it's really my, my view that, that the ladder has just simply collapsed. I mean, there's just not a ladder to climb up anyway. Not currently. A ladder. Really, uh, not much of a ladder. So that, I mean, uh, uh, these days the pot of gold seems to have gone away at the end of the rainbow and the entire concept of the music industry was built on the pot of gold because you had the guys at the bottom who were willing to work for spec so that they could get up to the level where they're making just a little bit of money and until they could keep impressing people so that they could climb up the ladder. And Again, my view is the fact that we are not talking about this as an industry. You know, when we get together a network, you've got, uh, for the most part, a bunch of, to be the center of the room, you're not the center of attention, but as the engineer, you're the center of the, the technological center of the room. You must command everything. We, as a group of people, are generally fairly prideful because we've got the ability to command all the things in the room. So something got us there which is our strong egos. Maybe we're not arrogant, but we have strong egos. Let's, let's call them hearty egos. So when we all get together in a room, we uh, really don't talk about how much we're not working. We talk about the cool projects we've been working on. But since we, not just engineers, but the music industry is completely, at all aspects, in denial of this, I, I tell people, <laughs> if we were any other industry, if we were coal miners or electricians, or plumbers, we would have bailed 36 months ago. But we're not. We're in this because we love music and we have a passion for music. We want to make records. We want, or, 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 or video games or, or post-production. I mean, I'm now working a lot in post-production. So, it, it, <coughs> it, but we love, generally we love audio and many of us are also music lovers. And since I'm, I'm speaking from what I know, so I'm talking about the music industry. But it's pretty clear to me that as a, as a larger industry, the music industry, though they are letting go of thousands of people every year at the labels, go into the, the, record, the former record label offices <coughs> in New York, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> floor after floor <coughs> of empty desks. And I was there 10 years ago. <coughs> it was floor after floor of desks filled with assistants and interns and marketing people and promotions people. And now it's, it's scary. It's a ghost town. And <clears throat> I mean, I'm not sure how aware all of you are of this, but because so many of the projects that I was working on were generally uh, uh, on the major labels, every December slash January, you would hear about how the all of them let go of at least a thousand or so employees. And that was going on year after year in the last five or so years. Um, every major label had a headquarters in Miami, a Latin headquarters in Miami, full staffs. Latin budgets were always smaller, um, uh, but nonetheless, these offices had full staffs. The, the record budgets were smaller, but these offices had full staffs. And when this downscaling started, um, those offices cut back to one person, the head of the label, no employees, and they worked out of their house. These are the headquarters for the Latin labels, for each of the major labels in Miami. So from that, you can kind of extrapolate the impact that, th that the downturn has had on the labels. Dude, there's always teaching. <laughs> so, yeah, well, I love teaching. So... My point is, though, it, it, yes, exactly. Uh, my point is this, though. Like I said, we have, we're going somewhere hopeful. So bear, bear with me. Um, my point of all this is, is that when the budgets have shrunk to the point where they are, clearly there's just not enough room in them for everybody to make the same money they used to make, which forces, unfortunately, the bands to do a lot of stuff themselves. So 
we're at a point, and we're beginning the hopeful portion. Let me talk piracy first, because I wanted to deal with the piracy question. I, wanted, I want to talk about the genie's out of the bottle, or the ship is sailed. Those are not true statements when, when addressing piracy. Okay, I'll just say, first of all, the cause of this problem is multiple things that we've been discussing. Desktop audio production, recession, uh, the quality of the music, the lack of soul and heart of the music. You know, if you look at music from the 60s till today, it's dramatic, the change. The productization, the corporatization <coughs> of the music, not the industry, but of the music itself. Okay, I think all of those things are factors. Um, but th what, has, what has caused the budgets to shrink is simply the downturn in sales. And what has caused the downturn in sales is that I've met people who are 24 years old who in their entire lifetimes have never made a music purchase, ever. Like, I asked one kid at an interview for an internship or something, so clearly it was in the audio industry that this person was interning for. I think I asked him just to gauge their musical taste, uh, what's the last CD they bought? Not at all intending to get the answer I got, <laughs> which was, I've never bought any music in my life. <laughs> and you are trying to get into this business? The, 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 average, the average college class might have one student out of 20 that has bought CDs. Right. Ever. Right. And, we, and, 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 it's, and, and that is clearly part of the problem. But <laughs> let me discuss the <laughs> things that. Like audio, let me address what I feel, because I've been following this piracy thing for a long time now. What I feel are some true misnomers. There, there, there are three pieces of information that, in my personal opinion, again, make the, the ship is sailed, the genie's out of the bottle, bottle uh, lines completely untrue. Uh, number one, it is actually completely illegal. The laws are in place to prevent this. The laws exist currently to prevent this. Okay. The technology exists. Everybody thinks this is anonymous. It's not anonymous. I could go into LimeWire right now, type in the song title of any song I want, and then write down the IP address of anybody that has that song that happens to be in my LimeWire, whatever the heck it is, your node or whatever. That an internet service provider cannot knowingly allow a customer of theirs to uh, do, do illegal activity if they've been informed. Keyword key knowingly. Right. So if they get informed, they have to cut that person off. So what is actually happening elsewhere in the world, and the tide, I've been tracking, like I said, the piracy thing for a long time. I've been tracking the dialogue for years. It was all pro-piracy. Every article I could ever find was pro. It's not that way anymore. They're starting to see reputable sources somewhat impartial. I'm not talking Rolling Stone. Somewhat impartial sources, people that aren't somehow invested in the success of the music industry, doing commentary on the subject that is not pro-piracy or pro-it-doesn't-hurt or pro-whatever-the-heck. Well, it isn't part of that because of the digitization of other elements of society is destroying mm -hmm. jobs and other yeah. elements yeah. of society. So yeah. we're all starting to They're starting aware. to see the pattern. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Starting to get pirated right, exactly. But here's what you might not know about is take into consideration the fact that the laws exist and the technology exists and that the genie is not really out of the bottle and the fact that they are actually doing something about it in other countries. France. In France. I was working with a client who was from France and was having a very similar conversation with them, the one we're having right now. And she was baffled. She didn't know what I was talking about, piracy. She said, we don't have piracy in France. Because even though the laws just came on the books, apparently, they've been doing something about it uh, for longer than the thing that just happened in the news recently. For, it must have been for about a, more, a year or more now uh, in France, if uh, you're found providing illegal music or uh, intellectual property uh, illegally, you get a notice. And uh, I think, I don't know the details, but it's something to the effect of the first time you get a notice and you're told to remove the material. Second time you get a notice and you lose your inter internet connection for a short time. Third time you get a notice and you lose your internet connection for even a longer amount of time. Uh, imagine a house of four people, okay? Uh, where one person is doing piracy and everybody in the house just lost their internet connection. Oh, and as part of the laws in France, 
that's not the only thing. You then get blacklisted. You can't get an internet service from anybody else. You're on a list. You're not allowed to have internet. Okay, so what is essentially missing is just the will, okay? So piracy is not, you know, we're not screwed as much as we might think we are. The will just seems to be not in place. Yes, to address it. One of the issues that I see um, is the sort of music industry versus the computer industry conspiracy. Uh, uh, the, uh, the issue here is the computer industry, and I love Apple, so don't get me wrong, I, I love the pain of the world. Well, let's not get into that. But, <laughs> this is the Moses I'm Avalon not, thing, I'm right? Apple, but I'm going to make an anti-Apple proposition, yeah, here, yeah. which is they want to you are a manufacturer of iPods and similar sorts of right. things, where you can sell high, high margin physical objects exactly. that then need to be filled with vast arrays of mm -hmm. music. I mean, if you've got a $300 device that needs to put $10,000 worth of material in you, right. essentially you're saying to people, we don't care how you fill this up, go ahead and fill it up. Right? It's to the advantage of the, the computer industry right. that people can go and pirate this stuff. And they totally. dwarf us in terms of their clout because they're a much larger revenue generating industry. Well, yeah, the, the, the Kindle. The Kindle's going to do the same thing, and, and it's already being talked about in the print industry. Right, you can do on Bit, BitTorrent, you can probably go get any book you want. 1,500 yeah. books yeah. can be stored on one device. Right, exactly. And so, so you're looking at the same kind of thing. So, right. Right, who's going to pay for all this? And I don't, I, I don't agree with that. It's, a, it's pitting the computer industry against the music, music industry. We are in a revolution of how we're going to deal with mm -hmm. this. Higher education, which I've been in, in for 20 some years, in the computer side of this, is having a hard time really getting its head around all this mm -hmm. because the expense of being able to track all this as an ISP, right? right that isn't that uh, Educause just did a, 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 a some assessment of how to how to track all this, mm -hmm. how much it's going to cost higher education, and it was in the billions of dollars. And so there is not just the, there is a, a lack of will. Sure. I like that. I like what France is doing, but the the cost to be able to track all this, especially and see what the music industry is doing. They're targeting targeting higher educational institutions mm -hmm. because it's an easy target. Mm -hmm. They're not targeting Comcast. They're not targeting. Right. The, uh, uh, they're the attempting to, but but the, the, the they're being rebuffed so heavily. So I, I don't. I, in Congress, I mean, they're, they're, the, the, the 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 ISPs lobby is just. Kicking the RIA's ass, mm -hmm. you know. But doesn't it have a lot to do with the fact that it is so difficult for people on in our part of the industry to convince a legislator that us losing capital is a bad thing? Don't they look at it as, well, your music, you aren't really important. We don't uh, really it, care. It, it appears. It it appears they do. It it, it does. I, I but I but as I said, I feel the, the tide is turning. Thought forty four one was more we were like way too much to devote to audio. <laughs> 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 they could only hear out to eight K anyway. Right, right, right. It, it, it seems to me that the kind of the compare. I haven't lived in France, but uh, from what you described, the comparison seems to be a social contract or literally a mm -hmm. law, re, uh, uh, relegating us to an administrative level. It's like if you get a parking ticket, you don't expect to go get your lawyer and and really get your rights represented. Right. And, and the, the the town of Boston or Cambridge, especially Cambridge, boy, <laughs> <laughs> the town of Cambridge is is not going to mess with your lawyer right. to nail your butt for right. that parking ticket. And in France, if you are if you are, I, you're using this, you've got this IP address, and lots of music is flowing out of your IP mm -hmm. address. Sure. You know it. Uh, you're not going to be speaking to any lawyer, and you're going to be speaking to somebody who probably gets paid about the same amount as you do. And it's at an administrative level, and it's like a parking ticket. Your, your ass is, is, mm -hmm. is in trouble, and that's just the way it is. Right. And you have to deal with it at that level. Whereas here, it seems it's still at the lawyer level. Yeah. Well, they're, they're moving away from the lawyer level, but I, I don't want to get too bogged down in the details as much as to say that my observation is, again, it's an observation, <laughs> that we, the tide is beginning to turn in the sentiment on the commentary, that there are actually places in the world where the laws and the will are in place. It's my feeling that that will propagate out, 
I, you, you hear more and more people speaking out against it and, 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 and giving valid arguments about it, presumably for the reasons that you pointed out, that more and more people are being impacted by right. it. Right, the movie industry and all that. Exactly, yeah. So that's the, one of the reasons that the, that, the, that, the, that the commentary is changing. But the, the, the trend that I see, and what I call the hopeful part of all of this, the, 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 the silver lining, is that Another aspect, in my opinion, this is purely my opinion, that brought this about is that I can't imagine if the technology existed in the 60s that music fans would have done this in the 60s. I can't imagine that. And th I'm inferring that, that people were so invested in the message of their artists and in their artists and what they were saying and in their music that they probably would not have stolen from them knowingly or intentionally. Well, the internet's changed the content conversation because it's content and it's electronic. And so it's, it's happening in the newspaper industry where people will go online and expect to read the newspaper for free, yet you would not go to a store and pick up a newspaper and walk away with it. There's You'll even hear lawyers, pro-piracy lawyers, make the argument that because there's not an actual physical piece of property now, that means there's no cost. Therefore, it shouldn't cost anything to buy. Okay? Now, here's why that's a stupid argument. <laughs> Aside from the fact that it's a stupid argument. <laughs> Let me just project back more than 100 years before recorded music existed before the only way that music was, was uh, um, for those of you who are students of this, was distributed was actually on paper. You had instruments at your house, whether it was a guitar or a piano, uh, and, uh, or some other uh, mus you know, musical instrument, and you purchased sheet music. The price of the sheet music was not the cost of the paper or the cost of the paper with a markup. The price of the sheet music was the value of the intellectual property on the piece of paper. So this argument about there's no physical thing, you make it once and then you have an unlimited amount of copies, so you should be able to give it away for free. I, I don't know how old these guys are, but they sound like they're right out of law school and they just love their own sound of their own words. So yeah, it's bullshit. Well, it's bullshit argument. For a while, you could buy an electronic subscription to the New York Times. Uh huh. Yeah. Right. I cheerfully funded that for fifty dollars a year. It's a steal. They stopped taking my money. They no, I, I, I don't. Again, I want to move music. past, and I don't want to get bogged. Let's let's come back to it. Let's, but I don't want to get bogged down into these details just yet. Let's come back to it. Let's come back to it for a second. Let's come back to it. What I wanted to say is the trend that I see. The trend that I see, and I might be wrong about this, but I want to I want to get to this point of the conversation to get us talking about it, and then we can also talk about piracy further is that at this point in time, as budgets shrink and shrink and shrink, the people that are leaving the industry are the people that were in it for profit. The people at the labels that are no longer at the labels are, were in it for the profit, you know, the corporatization. The, the, the inference I made with the 60s compared to today, music from the 60s, music to today. In the 60s, many people were in it for the music and it was sort of before the corporatization. I can think it was, before, for the most part, Peter before Frampton the corporatization. Is, is known as the one that started the, Peter Frampton Live is when everybody began to realize that they could make money. That's mm. in this, from what I've read, Interesting. that seems to be the line of demarcation. And, 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 and just, but my point is, before, before the major, before the major league, uh, before the major corporations became owners of the labels, because there was a time when they, when they weren't, and, and, and my point is, is that most of the people that were involved in the process on, on behind a desk, or behind a mixing console, or be, behind a microphone, they were in it for sheer love. Uh, and didn't necessarily expect to get rich. Everybody had stars in their eyes, of course. Everybody saw a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Everybody hoped to get there, but there was another element that, 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 that drove them as well. And, and it really seems, I don't know if Fall Out Boy is from Boston or not, but that's not my point, but it really seems that bands that are following that path today are just trying to find money. It appears to me when I listen to the music. Or any of the artists, pop, whatever, it just appears 
but I don't want to. I don't want to trash the music as much to say that I don't see that lasting forever. And the reason I don't, I see the silver lining to this cloud to be a renaissance in music of 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 real music. And I, I see it driven by only one thing: the people left in two plus years are going to be only one thing. They're going to be interested and loving and have to be passionate about the music. There's not going to be anybody willing to work at a record label unless they love music. This will force us to make music that is, I hope, greater, better, more soulful, more heartful, more real, more sincere. Um, I expect. Montana. Yes. <laughs> I expect. I expect. This is purely an opinion, but I expect that's what we're going to see in the next five years. I also expect, based on what I said already about piracy, that it will kind of coalesce with the monetization problem being solved. I'm an optimist, okay? I can't help it. Uh, it's obvious in, in, in my talking, although I'm very cynical about the music industry. But, uh, <laughs> and to turn me into a cynic, something had to kick my ass, so it was tough. But I became a cynic when it came to that one point. Um, uh, but I see something coalescing. I see monetization coming together with music that we haven't heard the like of for uh, many decades. Because I can't imagine people attempting to clone the latest band uh, that has a gazillion plays on some website because the band isn't making any money. So what's the point of cloning them except for the sake of having a gazillion plays on some website? It, that doesn't really make, you know, there's no pot of gold, so let's not chase the pot of gold. Let's, let's start making some music. So that's my view of where we're going. That's why I, I see it as, as hopeful. I mean, in, in, in many ways, uh, uh, Sean Fanning and the like probably didn't intentionally do what they started out to do to bring the music industry to its knees, but it was in the back of their heads. And they had been fed, I don't mean, and I don't mean that to say they were being malicious. What I mean is that something made them feel righteous in stealing the music. And it's my view that they, they meaning young kids, college students at the time, so we're going back 10, 10, 10 7, 8 years when this kind of got rolling uh, and it really took off. Uh, they felt righteous in doing this because they had been screwed by the labels year after year of one cool song that they really liked. The label keeps the single out just long enough. The single on this, I don't know if you're familiar with this standard practice in the music industry, but back when they had singles in record stores. Uh, um, was that the single was on the shelf just long enough to get it high enough on the charts to get enough people interested to go into the record store and buy the single, and they pulled the single, so they were forced to buy the album. Standard practice. Every artist you can think of. That's how it works. That's how re album sales are driven. Because the label's money, you know, their, their economics didn't work on selling singles. They couldn't, they couldn't make a profit off of selling singles. They could make a profit off of selling albums um, as long as they put out 20 artists and one of them sold a gazillion copies because the other 19 weren't even going to turn a profit. But the point was that, that that built up a resentment and as soon as the tools were, I feel, that built up a resentment and as soon as the, the public, the, the, the music fans were empowered to do something about it, they did. <coughs> With a friggin vengeance they did. And I don't think, as I said, it was anybody's conscious concerted intent to screw over the majors, but it was in that dialogue for the last, you know, you look on any of those websites, then it, it was there. It was that was a part of the dialogue. They hated the majors and they they really wanted to to screw them over. They didn't have any realization that they could do what they'd accomplished, which is eliminate them essentially. But uh, but really. Uh, but um, but they but I, I think there is a silver lining to that, which is I think the uh, Renaissance of music is about to happen. Yes? Charles, a lot of those people really, uh, you're almost giving them too much credit. Uh, they weren't out to get the label. No, that's what I mean. You know, they weren't. You know, we had some of those people come in and talk, and, and they were very, very naive. And this is a technology that's evolving. And as part of that technology, and as students of that technology, of science, of, of computers, 
it was almost their nature to have to do what happened. Now, the record companies certainly have a lot of blame, you know, a lot of fault. Um, I don't think they drove people to do this as much as this what's happened and the record companies did but not know were, how to respond. But they were trying to make a quick score. That's they them. were trying Some to make, the Napster were. people were definitely trying to make but a quick score. But no, let me, let me be very clear. I really don't think Sean Fanning, et cetera, meant to, did, created the software and empowered people to do this with the intent of, at the end of the day, taking the labels out of the game. No, I know they didn't, and I'm sure they'd have read a number of interviews with and about the story of Napster and, and Sean and so forth. All I'm trying to say is that, that on the websites I've done a lot of reading on, of the pro-piracy websites, a part of their discourse is, a, a, a deep-seated hatred for the major labels and, 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 and the RIAA and the corporations, et cetera, part, maybe a small portion of the discourse. But that hatred almost has been uh, developed since yeah. they've come up with Oh, no. no, no, no. The hatred's been there for years. Uh, yeah. It's just an opinion. But just an opinion, but that's my opinion. Remember that? Of course. That, and Congress fortunately didn't adopt it, but they wanted to make that the law. Let me ask you a question. You said something a minute ago. You got me thinking. You talked about that's my intent. Right. <laughs> well, and, and to whether I'm wrong or right. Sort of shift gears a little bit away from the piracy, but sort of going to the content a little bit. You mentioned that you you didn't feel like that the the fans of the '60s, even if the technology was available, would have done to the artists what what is being done today. And so, if you look at the trends of even live music and the number of clubs that are available for, for artists to play in, they have radically shrunk yeah. from where they were in the 60s. Because, going to your point, and I just want to get your sort of opinion on, on how this, the dynamic, the 60s and 70s, and forget about the 80s of Rain and Rock, you know, I'm not, I, I can't even think about that. Um, but the, the 60s and 70s of clubs and the message, there was, a, there, there was something there out there just passionately sure. singing their message. Right. Do you think that has also something to do with all, of this whole dynamic of how the music all sounds the same? And, the, I think and, so. you know, so, and there's, no, there's no affinity toward any one artist. I think so too. And, and these college kids are still listening to Pink Floyd and Led Zeppelin. Another point yeah. I make often is that kids today love artists from the 70s and 60s. With almost more passion than they do for any artist. Yeah. They will buy that, those records. Yeah. Well, as a, as a child of the era, I think you're kind of dreaming about people wouldn't have stolen it, because I snuck in every show I could sneak into. Right. <laughs> no, no, I could be. I could be. But I, I have a hard time imagining it, that it would have been a wholesale <coughs> theft of... Uh, which, 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 well, you, which you're not quite, quite the, the same percentage. Remember, steal you know. this book. Remember yeah, now, it, it was there. That's right. It was there. The class scene in the early '80s, remember, the drinking age moved its way up through the college years. Yeah. Right as I got, to, I mean, I got to Boston like early '80s, yeah, and and the right. drinking age moved up. But I was doing live sound and, and headlining acts were making thousands of dollars. And over the course of three or four years, they went down to making a couple hundred dollars. That's right. Musicians and got the, got that end of the, right. the shit. Really the stick Twenty-five years ago, the, 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 you know, the popularity of clubs dried up. Live right. sound and and you know yeah. clubs dried up because you couldn't drink anymore. The college kids in this town, especially, right? You know, Jacks and the Channel and and Club Three, all the clubs around that area were mobbed with college kids every Friday and Saturday night, and suddenly they couldn't drink, and so those clubs dried up. And that's a separate issue altogether. Sure. But I, that definitely drove. But you know, at the same kind of like, time, there was a change in philosophy regarding quality of performance, and unfortunately, a glut of, I don't know how to say it any other way than this. Can you say MIDI? No, <laughs> incapable musicians. A glut of mediocrity. Well, MIDI is well, well, destroyed. Right. So, I mean, anytime the technology is going to drop in Lack price, of understanding of what to do with MIDI. MIDI. Yeah. yeah. Another thing is that there are almost more producers than consumers now. <laughs> well, if you define a consumer as somebody that pays for music, you are right. <laughs> there, there's literally millions of MySpace, banned MySpace That's so pages, true. And, there, and, and if you have the talent, you could make a hit record in your bedroom now. 
There, there will be an Xbox. That entire uh, sentence was in quotes, right? Yes, <laughs> if, if you have the talent. It's just like digital photography. You can take billions and billions of really, really horrible pictures, but there'll be the occasional one thing that'll pop out. Uh, I, I run a company that does legal, legal, <laughs> I run a company that does legal downloads, and people come to me to just dying to figure out ways to give their music away by any means necessary, so people could, so they can try to rise the surface. And it, it is empowering the people. Places like Guitar Center probably couldn't exist in the '60s if everybody wasn't a musician. That's the end of the business is thriving. The pro audio end is thriving. Yeah, all these, all these companies that are, you know, because everybody's a musician. Everybody's, a, you know, has the chance to, to live sound. And, and right. Right. So there, that's a whole, that's, that's, but that, that the, the garage band and the, and the guitar center but thing, a, a that's another reason why I actually I'm imagine right. that music's going to change. If I, I'm a musician and I'm giving my music away, I'm putting that type of value on it, and then I look at someone like Hannah Montana, and I say, well, I'm, I'm giving that away, why, why, why shouldn't you? you know? <laughs> I mean, there, I, 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 there's, there's a devil's advocate about the, the record companies. They, they spent all their money researching what people were going to buy mm -hmm. instead of researching and developing artists. In the 60s and 70s, artists were developing. Yeah, right. You were looking for a payoff, the third record down the, down the street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you don't find that anymore. By the '80s and the '90s, they were looking for one hit that was going to totally. was going to match the match the model. Totally, it was all corporate driven garbage. But but there was there was much fewer artists, and the reason why is that essentially this has the whole thing with the, the direction from where the piracy is coming from to where it's moving. In the past, it, we're talking about duplication of information, and from a fundamental point of view, duplicating information doesn't physically cost anything. Anybody, you know, nowadays you can just copy a file and it doesn't cost anything. But back in those days, if you wanted to hear music and say, boy, I really like that song, can I have it? I mean, it wasn't like the guy had a, 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 a vinyl press that he could press you another album and then pass it to you, whereas now it, they can press it and it's, I, it's pristine and it goes to you. Often, you know, you get an MP3 instead of the real, you know, 16-bit thing. Mm -hmm. But the, the thing is, is it cost a lot of money to press vinyl. Nobody pressed vinyl unless they were either rich or good. And well, so nobody cut out of it because going into a million dollar facility costs right, a lot of money. Right, right. And so now the, all that, that, all that from the beginning has gotten cheaper. Yeah. I mean, everybody has their bedroom. The, get GarageBand on, on, on and, and any, anybody can produce something that actually can, if they're good, can actually sound pretty good. And then how are they going to, I mean, we didn't have indie labels back then either. You can only have indie labels if you can take your, you master it yourself and you take it to somebody to press and they press it for 25 cents a copy or something like that and you sell those CDs yourself. Well, I mean, if, if, just to re kind of repeat what I was saying, I mean, the pattern I see is that currently we're dealing with this conversation that we just had has not filtered down to the kids that are cloning Fall Out Boy, okay? They still think the pot of gold's there, to some extent. Because they still see people, what they believe is, swimming in that pot of gold. But the reality is it's not there. The, the big artists that I've worked with in the past, they're freaking out. They're not making any money. You know, I don't want to name any of them, but they are freaking out. They're not making money. They're losing money, they're not making it. Okay? Some of, the, like... One of the biggest female artists of the last four years, freaking out because she's not making a dime because it, it's all going out the door. You know, her costs are obviously much higher than, than some MySpace clone band. But the point is, it isn't going to take long for this to filter down. Whether we all sit in denial and don't discuss it uh, and don't talk about it in the media, which we've been doing, and not talking about it in the media, I mean. Uh, in other words, I, I don't hear organizations representing uh, all of our collective industries talking very much about how absolutely dire this is. Trying to get the word out that, that you know, as I said, imagine for a moment when I first thought of this analogy, it was way less imaginable. Imagine for a moment, it's actually comical at this point, imagine for a moment if the oil companies said to the car companies, look, 
we know you can't sell cards because people keep stealing them off the car lot. But what we'd like you to do is just keep making those cars so that we can keep selling oil. <laughs> That's kind of where we are right now. But my point is about the filtering down and, 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 and the clone artists is that the reason we are in a place today, w one reason where we are in a place today where uh, uh, um, cloning is rewarded uh, is because it has been rewarded for about 20 to 30 years. In other words, the producers that got work were the producers that could create records that sounded like somebody else. The A&R people that signed people were generally rewarding and it just kind of, as a feedback loop, it just kept getting really close to a howl. So, you know, in, in, the, in the 80s, it wasn't quite as, as uh, um, uh, recycling, but as we get into today, it's like I can't tell the difference from any of these people and I don't think it's because I'm older. Because I've got the years to tell the difference. Um, and they, 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 so many of these artists sound the same. And it's because the, the, the corporatization created this and rewarded this pattern of being able to duplicate a product that sounded like another product. And I mean, I've been in A&R offices where literally the A&R guy puts together the team to make a record and I'm not kidding, he looks at the billboard charts, he sees there's the producer, you know, looks at the top 20, picks a producer on a song, picks a writer on another song, throws them together with uh, the engineer that mixed this, and, and, and says, go make a hit, basically, with this fourth artist that I have over here. And, and how many of you have been in a recording studio and either participated in the conversation or, been, or, or, or at least heard the conversation where somebody said, I don't know, what do you think? Does it work? I mean, the does it work line, the does it work question has been the question that's driven every recording session, every major label recording session that I've be, worked on for, for more than a decade and a half. But does it work means essentially one thing. Do you think this could be a hit on the radio that would get people to go into the stores to buy it? It doesn't mean, is this great? Is this, is this a cool song? Do you like this song? Is this good music? That conversation, which I'm sure was had at, in, at a some point, and is still had in some studio somewhere, was not the conversation and the work ethic that was rewarded by the major labels for a good two decades. So the feedback loop of this carbon copied clone sound has really gotten to the point where it's a part of how music is made and how people coming up believe it's being made because all the successful people around them are working that way. And I'm, I'm, I'm fairly confident that it's about to collapse in on itself because once this reality reaches out to the, to, the, to, the, to the young kids that are trying to make music, because it's, it's actually already starting to happen. I mean, listen to what's happening in the indie scene. A lot of original sounding music. That doesn't sound like anything you've ever heard or certainly isn't trying to sound like stuff you've heard. They are definitely on the indie scene trying to do something different. And I think this is gonna start to filter out and I think in the next five years, we're gonna hear some very inventive music created by people on all sides of the glass uh, that have a passion for it. And, and that's my hope. But not only is it my hope, I don't think the forces that are at play right now are gonna allow much else to happen. Bad copies there, have always made the best music. Yeah, there's not yeah. gonna be a reward for carbon copy music. There isn't a reward for it now. Where's it gonna come from? But isn't the, there, there's just one thing that's missing is that there still is no control <coughs> over at least in this country, and in France there, and there's something in Amsterdam, but in this country there's no instrument, there's no place for an independent artist to go. Like I work with Mike Kelsey, and he's an independent singer-songwriter, puts his own records out, and his stuff is getting cloned, or it's getting sold on the internet. The only place that we've been able to stomp it out is in Amsterdam. 
we just call the guys up and say, hey, right. such and such has got it, shut them off. It, literally, that day, it's done. Well, look, I'm not but we don't an internet that. expert. But let me share with you something. Google's spiders <coughs> find things on the internet within hours of them being posted. Anybody here familiar with Google Alerts? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, Google Alerts kick ass. It used to take Google Alerts days to alert me of something that got posted on the internet. It now takes a couple of hours. If Google can track all the content on the internet, if all I got to do is put in the name of a song on LimeWire and me, and with my moronic internet skills, can find out the IP address of everybody with it sitting on the hard drive. It, the, book, uh, the, the, the laws are essentially in the books that say that all the internet service providers have to do is be notified. And the thing that needs to happen, the last piece of the puzzle, is the will. And I haven't read the document yet, but uh, Obama's cybersecurity thing mentions the word, I did a search on the document, it's a pretty long document, uh, mentions the word intellectual property three or four times, and I've read those paragraphs. So I don't know if you're familiar with the cybersecurity thing, but Obama uh, has got a position in his, it's not his cabinet, but he's got a position that he's outlined essentially called the cybersecurity czar or department head or whatever. And all they have at this point is an outline. An outline for the, the job and, and an outline for what they're going to do. So they're just getting started. But it, he had talked about this during the campaign and he's now acting on it. And like I said, I've read the document and the goal of the document is much more about protecting our, our, infra our, 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 elect our IT infrastructure or protecting our grid, the, the electrical grid from that big knock, that big domino effect thing that happened in the Midwest. Uh, not too long ago, I don't think it affected you guys, but Ohio and Indiana, and they all, you know, one switch apparently blew by accident and it just took out. A, so it's their belief that that could very easily be created by terrorists, et cetera, those types of problems, and, uh, you know, hits on the CIA computers and all that. So that's, that's a large part of what that cybersecurity document is about. But it does mention intellectual property, like I said, four times, and I've read those portions of it, and it appears. One of the things they're attempting to address there seems to be this problem. Bottom line, in my opinion, and in my research, the genie is not out of the bottle. The ship has not sailed. The technology exists. Look, I said 10 years ago, and I, and I believe it still to this day, the problem was created by technology. The problem can be resolved by technology. The, the site, the, you shut them down and they just move over to another website. If Google can find new content within hours of being posted on the internet, a properly programmed spider or whatever, IP spider, can find the new website within hours. So I, I, I don't believe this problem cannot be licked by technology. I'm confident that it, we're all technologists. It doesn't make sense that the problem can't be solved by technology. The, the bad guys are too. Yeah, and they changed they changed titles. You could have and you know if you had like the original audio that was MP3 eyes two different ways, mm -hmm. the bits are going to be completely different. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, mm -hmm. so you're not going to have some dumb Google computer looking at bits and saying, "Oh, that's your song," you know, and telling you about it. It's not going to recognize that they if they what we call hashing. And, uh, that's not hashing exactly true. Type. If Shazam can recognize anything played over yeah. a speaker. The technology exists right. to recognize well, the, the, the file. The AES conventions, this is one of the hot topics in AES, is being able to look up music on the internet, being able to do uh, like recognition of the actual musical content despite the way it's encoded. Do you know what I'm saying? I didn't think that that was a solved problem. Well, look at it this way. I I've heard these arguments before, and I never really understand them completely when somebody <coughs> says they changed the name of the file. Therefore, you're not going to be able well, to if find. If you the name of the yeah. file, you might. This is my, like I don't get that. Yeah. If I disguise the name of the file, how's anybody else going to put oh, in genie in a bottle and the, find the, the file? The when you've not changed the name you, of the file will, to something will different. Will inform your browser how to unhash the name. Okay, say that last part. If 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 somebody else who's like who wants to be the appster and wants to you know be the distributor of all this illicit music, and the names have all been hashed so that they don't look they look like garbage. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when you, but when you go to their site and say, all right, you download our little app or it's a little uh, Java app or something like that, and then unhashes that for the kid or whoever's going to do the pirating, mm -hmm. 
then they'll get that name. Yeah, but that, that technology is available to everybody, including the enforcer. But My point is, if technology... For, what? Yeah, you're not, you got to no download that app. Sir. That's the issue. Will. Will. Yeah. Not technology. Yeah. If the technology exists to hash the title, the technology... The I little applet is taken by the enforcer and used to dehash right. the title. So I don't get this. But why can't we in AES and people in our industry just focus at an AES convention, maybe even the next one coming up in, in I think, in New York or wherever. Yeah. Why can't we just sit down and say, here is the start of a plan that we could bring other portions of the industry into and start to, whoa, band together mm -hmm. and start doing things as a artistic uh, engineering community because part of our what we do as engineers we're artists yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and, and the musicians are artists but, but what, what you're saying is band together and then the action that we're going to take is what? There's got to be <laughs> a, I'm not being insulting or sarcastic no, no, but there's got to be a way for a big company or Joe on the street mm -hmm. whoever you know Joe is, or Mike Kelsey his music's getting pirated and he's what, what am I going to do? My, my songs are getting pirated. Well, you should be able to go to a place and inform them, my stuff is getting pirated. There's too Could many you bands please? that are pushing, like, take my music. Well, but, but they're not doing it out of, uh, out of their desire to, to give their music away. They're doing it because they don't have a choice because who's going to buy it anyway? Yeah. And, and I don't mean because their music's crappy, but I mean because there's no channel. The but, channel but, doesn't but exist anymore. Uh, but if there's an alternative... For you to say, I want to, here, I'll give some of these songs away and get people interested. You can do that on, you know. Video. Well, don't take my word as gospel. And I, and I didn't come in here with the, the, with the technological proof because it really wasn't my point. I didn't mean to focus as long as I did on the piracy. But the technology has existed for more than a long time. Uh, for, I mean, for more than a, for a few years. Uh, there are companies that are in, whose sole purpose uh, is to track this and are employed by the labels and th through the RIAA. Um, uh, and I know this because there was a time when I felt that getting into that business would have been really smart. Ten years ago, I thought, hey, it would be really smart to, to get involved in trying to solve these problems. So that's why I've been tracking this for so long, because my brother's a Carnegie Mellon educated uh, computer programmer, and we talked about it a lot. So I've had a lot of conversations with him. But at this point in time, I'm so confident that the technology isn't the issue. It's not, it hasn't been the issue for at least three years. Political will. Yeah, political will. It's just political. And, and, and my point is the political will has, is, is happening in other places. It's being discussed in Asia, in Japan. It's being discussed in Europe. It got shot down. It's being discussed here. It got shot down. Uh, Congress voted to, to protect people's rights to steal music. And I ain't kidding. But, but, but I believe the tide will turn. And I, I feel it'll turn, and I really feel that within five years, not within, in about five years, the music industry will be about at where it was 10 years ago as far as its income. Maybe not, maybe five is a little too optimistic. Let's make it seven. <laughs> but I think what's going to make it so much better is that the music will have been completely... It, it, we don't know what it's going to sound like, but it will be completely different than what we're hearing today. Why will the tide turn? What's that? Why will the tide turn? Why? For all the reasons that I've said. In other words, the technology is already there. The laws are already there. The will is starting to change. The tide is starting to shift already. It, it's just, it's still bubbling under. So that's well, my will, view. The will tends to be just for people who want to send music for free. I mean, the will to... Per I mean, we in this room have the will to want to protect the integrity of the music, but most of the kids out there, they yeah, want to send their... Let me, let, me, let, me, let me explain it in another way. So an example, I, or an analogy I often make uh, is this. Um, we 
Don't steal from stores, most of us. Do not shoplift from stores, not because we know it's illegal. That's not why we don't do it. Most of the people in this room either got caught or knew somebody that got caught or knew somebody that knew somebody that got caught when we were kids. We learned that lesson the hard way. In my case, it was my brother. Okay? In other uh, words, you learn from being burned or right. being scared about right. being burned. How many people in this room know somebody that got in trouble for that? Oh, At some point in their oh, yeah. life. How many in this people know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody that got in trouble for piracy? Yeah. One person. One person. Okay? When the will comes into play and the enforcement begins, many people will know somebody that got their internet cut off. That's not getting thrown in jail. That's not, that's not like I said, it's already stopped in France. It only took 12 months. It's going to take a long time for the money to get back around and back and, and, and bubble up and, and bubble down. But, you know, longer than one year. But piracy, apparently, so, apparently, so I've been told by multiple sources, is, is already gone in France or is not as rampant, let's say. It's not gone. Uh, I'm sure that there are paths to piracy in France. But it's not as rampant as it used to be. Um, right, let me then finish answering the question and then, and, and then, and then uh, so... When more people know somebody that had their internet shut off, they didn't get sued for $200,000 or anything goofy like that that seems way disproportionate and, and way like, what? These corporations are really idiots. Let's screw them further. Come on, steal their music, you know? Screw Britney Spears, that, that whole attitude. It'll change because it'll be like, crap. I don't want to lose my internet or, or whatever. Because it, it'll, it can directly affect you yeah. very quickly. Just the same as I'm not going to park on that street in Cambridge because right. I don't want another one of their teams. I'm not going to speed because I just got a speeding ticket. Yeah. You know, that thing. I mean, it's, it will change people's view of this because right now piracy feels like it's, not, first of all, it feels like it doesn't hurt anybody because we are allowing the public to believe that. We are not up in arms. We are up in arms when we get behind closed doors, but we as an industry, a broad music industry, are not up in arms. And, and when they know somebody that's got in trouble or they got in trouble, it's going to change people's view of this. And to have Britney, I'm done in one second, to have Britney Spears do, sorry to keep going back to Britney, do a PSA to, to, dis, to, to discourage people from doing piracy, it was the dumbest move, or whoever else they used, <laughs> that I could have ever imagined. Nobody cares or relates to her loss of income. But if they would have done the ad differently, that was a little more touchy-feely human that said, you know, steal from this faceless artist. Don't give us Britney Spears. Give us a faceless artist. And then show, as the lights go up, the 500 other people that are losing their income behind the face that you happen to know. People would relate to it more. And we're not, we, the industry, is not addressed... It's too late. That, ha that should have happened five years ago. You know, at this point, like I said, the, the, the majors aren't even there. They're, they're seas of desks and floor after floor of empty desks. Just a, you, you, just a yeah. quick point. That, uh, France also had the political will to take on iTunes and Apple a couple of years ago for being a monopoly and broke their power. Huh. And, and, and that's Good part of why they did this. Too. It sort of relates to that earlier fact. I think another thing that was, might have been going on in France is there's a lot of I'm not a Frenchologist, so I don't know a lot about France, but in my casual observations of that country and what the government sponsors, they really sponsor the arts. Oh, heavily, oh, yeah, heavily subsidize art sponsorship. And they always and, have. Right, yes. So the, the arts being, you know, intellectual property, music, software, et cetera, that are, well, I wouldn't call necessarily all software necessarily arts, but clearly music and, and, and so forth. They're trying to protect that in part. Absolutely. I, I'd like to add some pessimism then to your optimism. Please. That's <laughs> why, um, so why we're having the conversation. I mean, the, the biggest concern <coughs> of star of music is young people. And it's been a long time since we've had uh, music education in the schools. Mm. That, that goes not just for the performance ability, but that also goes for what they listen to and what they sure. enjoy listening to. And uh, I'm very pessimistic about what, what people are going to be listening to in 10 years. From, I hear from you. that reason right, right alone. And that's, that's a, 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 a cultural thing as well. But, I mean, just looking at my childhood, I don't think my 
I think my musical ability was influenced by me being a part of the music program in my high school. But my musical taste was so much more informed by my friend's records. I understand, but you had a music program in your high school. Right, but... And in your elementary school. Yeah, but we were playing horrific music in high school band <laughs> that in no way influenced me to, to be into Pink Floyd or, or whoever. So I don't think it did. I could be wrong about that. Yeah, but uh, yeah. your music appreciation. Is not yeah, there's a, there's a connection. Even as a reaction. Well, well, but I guess what I'm trying to say is... I guess what I'm trying to say is... There were only 30 people in our band, and more than 30 people in my school bought records. So I, I really, I, I'm not trying to say we shouldn't have music programs in the school. Clearly, we should. But uh, I, I, I think whether we have them or not, if the music were more real, people might have a reason to want to actually pay for it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And less of a product. Yeah. I, th I think you've had your hand up. I think there's a lot of music out there now that's actually really worthwhile, and I agree that it's yeah. going to get better. But we there have, is. There's we a, have lot. a generation trained that content is either free or cheap. And yeah. when it goes away, are they really going to want to, are they just going to move to something else, or are they going to pick up the stuff that's free? Well, it might be better to develop a business uh, plan that makes it more convenient, or as convenient as stealing stuff rather than. Because, I mean, not, the. I work in newspapers, and, and nobody under 30 cares that they're going to be gone in five years. They just, oh, they do even expect it. And they don't really care. They don't want to save it. They just, they figure, they'll just go somewhere else and get their stuff for free. They're just used yeah. to getting everything easy and free. Isn't that business plan the ultimate, like what I, the iTunes model? You know, it's just, just 99 cents, I may as well buy it rather than steal it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think that's, that's, the, that's where the, the record companies themselves had failed because they were fighting this fight to, yeah. Yeah. to, to, yeah. to you know, come down, look, look like a heavy against people. Mm -hmm. It yeah. should have made, made it easier for people to get their stuff. Which is what, which is just to address this point, which is exactly what the, the, the visual media outlets are doing. I mean, I don't know how many people in this room, I, I, I really don't participate in piracy, but uh, I, 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 I don't even have LimeWire on my dock. Um, <laughs> Um, but, 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 and I, I've been buying from iTunes probably from the week it, the iTunes store existed. I'm almost certain the minute it was announced, I was like, wow, and I went there and immediately started buying. But the point I'm trying to make is that th clearly the labels did not address this problem appropriately. Clearly the visual media outlet seems to have uh, uh, re learned the lesson, and the point I'm trying to make when I said I don't participate in piracy, though, is that I have gone to some of the visual sites that stream illegal content, and it's horrific. The bad video cameras on TV screens, it's like bad YouTube sometimes. Whereas you go to Hulu, where there's a monetization path, or you go to iTunes, I have purchased so many TV shows that I don't happen to have on my cable channel, whether it's Showtime or AMC or some network that I don't have, but I read about some cool new show or I've discovered something on Hulu, and I'm watching tons of television programs now online, legally online, with a monetization pass. Somebody's making some money out of it, and the labels didn't realize the right path the me visual media people seem to, television essentially, and movies, but especially television, seem to have realized that, and they're now providing the outlet and providing such a better experience, it's actually better to watch it from their websites than it is almost to watch it on TV. If any of you have been going to the, the network websites and watching TV shows, it's, it's, it's so cool. Well, that's, that's been the last few years because of the yes. rise of broadband. And the yeah, I, absolutely. To computers to actually be able to deal with it. No, absolutely. <laughs> The music industry's been hampered by the, you know, it's been small files you can pass around thing, and if you can get to better quality that we can somehow work, and, you know, that, that would help too. It's... Uh, Sean, oh, sorry. I think there's a, to talk to your silver lining part, there's, <laughs> uh, there's, there's one example out there that I really, really like a lot. One of my favorite labels is a label called Yep Rock, and uh, they have a lot of really good rootsy artists, like John Doe and Mercedes, uh, surf rock band called Loose Straight Jackets. They have a fantastic business model. Uh, if you subscribe to their newsletter, you get the, the alert. You get a pre-release alert 
you order uh, the vinyl, that I am a vinyl fanatic, order the vinyl, pre-release, uh, two weeks before the release comes out, you get an email, thank you for the pre-release, here is your high-res digital download mm. available in your stash. You know, right. You know, download that now, enjoy it. And yep. Yep Rock. Yep Rock and yeprock.com? Yeah, yep Rock. Cool. Excellent business model. Yeah, it's still like, um, you know, uh, indie artist, uh, it's basically, you know, you know, play to, to, to pay, you know, like, right, right, right. Because you know, a lot of these guys, you know, they, uh, like, blow straight jackets, they just tour the fucking asses off all right. around the world, and that's how they are able to, you know, make their records and stuff like that, but they have a distribution channel, uh, a positively marketed right. distribution channel. That's very cool. Um, yeah, two, two little holes I want to poke in your heart. Please do. I, I like the idea that, that the pendulum will swing back. I think it's true. I'm not sure exactly how. But you talk about the cheap, the, the, the good music being out there. Look at the economics of publishing a classical music album. <laughs> I mean, that, that, just, that argument doesn't work. We started this whole content is free thing with ad-supported radio and television. Back in the 60s, all the music I wanted was free. All I had to do was turn on the radio. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't even that much ads. But it wasn't free. Well, no. If I wanted to own There was a monetization. Can, no, 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 no. It was monetized. Well, right. But the point you is, had to pay a price, I and the price was you had to listen to the commercial. Printing your brain. But I could turn my brain off. You could, but are you trying to tell me there's not a single product you've ever purchased from advertising? Oh, I can purchase stuff from advertising. Yeah, so you didn't turn your brain off, and advertising works, but we, that's, we know advertising works. Yeah, the point is, it wasn't free, and right. there was monetization, but the monetization, which is what the visual TV people are doing. The monetization thing isn't obvious. I mean, we have TiVo now. We can skip the ads, all that stuff. I mean, but it came out of the monetization being so indirect that people stop being aware of it. I mean, yeah, you buy stuff from ads, but you don't really think about it. An ad comes on for something you don't want, you tune out. An ad comes on for something that maybe doesn't matter want. if you tune out. Still but tuned I, in. I, it doesn't work that way. I, I think I think it's a. It doesn't work that way. I think I think it was an understood contract between the consumer and the creator that. If you wanted the free music, you had to at least address the commercial, whatever that means. Changing the channel, ignoring it, turning off your radio, whatever. But you had to do something about it. You couldn't magically make the commercial disappear. But the ads are where the rage against the machine started. Really? Really? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Definitely. Can you walk me through that one? I just don't get well, it at all. It's, it's actually funny because I would not listen I would prefer to go out and buy the CD or download the song from Apple because I don't want to listen to that crap. No, but wait, no, no, no. You got to walk me through where the rage in the machine started, which means you're going back to the '70s, I guess, or something. So, no, 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 so walk, walk me through the, okay. walk me through the pre-rage and oh, now there's commercials. I'm mad at stage. No, I don't get no, no, it. Well, you have to go back to 1927 or something. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the point is that yes, it's part the youth of in '25 were very complacent, right? Or no? <laughs> That whole generation, <laughs> our grandparents. It's, it's part of the cost. It's part of the contract. If you're an adult, you understand the contract. You're getting this music for free because you're listening to the ads. Mm -hmm. But you're a kid in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And you're listening to these stupid, annoying ads. Mm -hmm. Well, some of the ads are pretty cool. Can, can we go? Can we go to such and such park? Can we mm -hmm. watch the funny cars smash each other, please? Mm -hmm. But a lot of the ads are annoying, and you're a kid, and you don't make the connections. That's the beginning of the rage against the corporate model. The thing that makes ads fun is when the ads are well produced. People voluntarily tune in to the ads on the Super Bowl because they are cool ads. Mm -hmm. But not all the ads are cool, and some of them are really annoying. And it's the, it's the annoyance factor that is the kernel of, gee, you, I can use the TiVo to skip the ads? And of course, another piece of it is the number of ads per hour has been steadily increasing over the years. These shows have been getting smaller so that the ads can get bigger. 
Well, what if the show itself becomes an ad? Hello, American Idol. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. I don't watch but that but you, you don't have to watch that. You, oh, you turn that off. It's when it's the insertions. When I talk to people who are trying to set up new business models to, to um, sell their stuff, they're trying to figure out how to make the ads inobtrusive. Mm. Because it's the obtrusive ads sure. that become annoying. No, but I think sure. that the kernel of the, of the, oh, it's the corporate machine out to screw us, comes from the combination of the intrusive ads and the realization that advertising works even when you don't want it. Well, not that it relates to any of this, except it, it, it references Apple. I stop my TiVo when I see those two guys, and I back up and I watch that commercial. <laughs> Every new Apple ad, I watch it. I'm fair, do, do, do. oh, wait, it's an Apple ad. <laughs> God, these guys are funny. <laughs> That's just me. Yeah, every I mean, ad with Ozzy Osbourne in it, I hate yeah. to say it. Uh, like fast forwarding, like, oh, wait, oh hold on. It's another Ozzy ad, ad. yeah. No guy's way. hilarious. So, so, I agree. There's a philosophy that has to get addressed. So, again, how do we, in our industry, do something? And the only way that we do it is by getting together, like we're doing here, and talking. And then we've got to get more people together and talk. So, I, I, do you, where, where? My call to act, my, my, this isn't exactly a call to action speech or talk. It's more a, it's trying to kickstart the conversation talk. But if I have a call to action or actions, they would be, one, share the plight of the music industry with as many normal consumers as possible because that's what I've been doing. I do it every time I yeah. teach. Yeah, you may all do it already, but I, I'm, my, I'm, it's like unbridled at every opportunity. I'm, I'm, I'm sharing the, the, the harsh, harsh reality of what's happened in the last uh, ten years uh, with as many young people as I can find. Um, uh, so that's one way. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, another way is by continuing to work on great music which I know everybody in this room wants to do. So, um, you know, when the opportunity arises to work on something really cool uh, and there's a way that it might be able to get out there and you can be a part of it, obviously that's, not, that's something you would want to do anyway, but I truly believe we will be doing that and we will be making some music that we can't even imagine right now that once we hear it, we'll be like, wow, we wish we had this five years ago something so real that I just can't believe somebody even thought of these sounds, stringing them together like this. Because, because the reason the music is so uninspiring is because what inspired all of us to get into the first place is that we could not believe what we were hearing. We had no idea how it was being created and we wanted to figure it out so we could do it ourselves. And it's not because we all kind of understand the techniques all the way down to how every little hi-hat is created today that makes the music that's on the radio uninspiring. It's because it's uninspiring. D it, people aren't listening to the radio as much as they used to because the music is uninspiring. And I think we will all be, uh, you know, commercial, uh, you know, we're talking the, 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 the top 30 kind of radio. It's uninspiring because in many ways it is because people are simply trying to duplicate and copy. And I, and I, and I imagine and some very inspiring records coming. They're already coming out, as I've said, on the indie labels, and that's one of the reasons I imagine it moving over to the to the majors, because it's the majors, uh, because the majors aren't really majors anymore. But the point is that that because it's happened multiple times before. It happened in the '60s. Those were artists. Many of the of the of the the people changing the sounds and that were so new and inventive were on independent labels, and then they were the indies were often bought by the majors. Um, uh, and uh, it happened again in the, around the same kind of time, a downturn in the music industry uh, in the early 80s, very early 80s, um, late uh, 70s, and uh, a lot of the cool new different music uh, was coming from indie labels and the majors bought all the indies. It, it's, it's, it, there's not going to be a lot of money for the major labels to buy the indies uh, probably um, uh, in, in, in the next three to five years, but I, I manage they'll work it out. That's what I believe. And I, I really believe that there are groups out there that take music seriously. They're absolutely. Absolutely. Music. Uh, they're changing the uh, distribution channels. 
I'm yep. really there to support the artists. Yep. Uh, I, I subscribe to a, a, a service uh, from a, a store in New York City called Other Music. And uh, I'm telling you folks, the, the stuff that these guys carry is anything from like avant-garde jazz, avant-garde, uh, you know, uh, progressive rock. You get a, a newsletter, you get like real audio clips of, you know, the, the, the tr some of the tracks on the albums. I never would have heard of Shogun Kunatoki, you know, from Finland, who are doing absolutely mind-boggling, you know, uh, progressive instrumental rock, you know, if it weren't for this type of service. And I think these guys are on the cutting edge. These guys are setting a model yep. for the new distribution channels. You know, there's tons of great music out there. What's the name again? Other music? It used to be in Highwood Square, too. Yeah, yeah. I smell my time is here is done. <laughs> I see Tony sitting in the front row. Yeah.